So some muscles of the forearm now, and I've always found it easiest to start here in the cubital fossa with the tendon of biceps brachii, and if you move medially, the first muscle fibres you hit should be pronator teres. Now on this model, that's really clear and easy to spot. If you're looking at a specimen, bear in mind that this structure here, the bicepital aponeurosis, will be running over the pronator teres and attaches fairly firmly to flexor carpi radialis and pulls it a little bit laterally. So the, the fibres of pronator teres might, especially if it's a very small muscle, um, a very, if it's a very small specimen, might be a little bit hidden by the flexor carpi radialis. So please just check. Okay, on this model, the first fibres you hit, if you move medially from the biceps brachii distal tendon, will be pronator teres. On a specimen, they, they may or may not be. So just check. You may need to move flexor carpi radialis a bit to find the muscle fibres here. But if, if we were to remove some superficial extensors, we can then follow the, t the pronator teres a bit further and see where it attaches to the lateral surface of the mid radius. So that's pronator teres. Next we should hit flexor carpi radialis, which is a larger muscle, has a long tendon that attaches down here onto the uh, metacarpals and um, is just lateral of the midline of the, of the forearm. Next to that, if it's present, we'll have palmaris longus, which will be probably smaller than this muscle belly here is indicating, and have a very thin tendon. The good news is you can easily check if it is palmaris longus or not. If there's a skinny tendon that's attaching in to this, which is the flexor retinaculum that makes the roof of the carpal tunnel, then you're looking at palmaris longus. And often on the specimens, the palma aponeurosis will uh, still be attached here and the tendon is continuous with that as well. So if there's a small skinny tendon attaching into the flexor retinaculum and the palmar aponeurosis, you know you've got palmaris longus. You can follow it back to the muscle belly, which will probably be quite small. Then next to that, if we keep moving medially, we have flexor carpi ulnaris, which is large and is right on the medial border of the forearm and so the tendon is attaching in here to the initially to the pisiform so you can feel it right on the edge there should be easy to spot right on that medial edge so that's the first layer there's four muscles in the first layer of flexors well, let's just remove most of them now and we'll have a look at the second layer now the second layer only has one muscle in it and here it is flexor digitorum superficialis so attaching proximally the medial epicondyle traveling down to the middle phalanges of digits two, three, four, and five. If you're looking at it here, which is where you will often find it uh, most, well, it'll be most visible here on a specimen, you'll often just be looking at tendons. There won't always be muscle fibers this far distal. All right, so that's the second layer. So four muscles in the first layer, one in the second layer. If we remove most of flexor digitorum superficialis, we find in the third layer, this muscle out here on the lateral side, flexor pollicis longus. We can see that it has a tendon that's on its medial aspect and the muscle fibres are coming in obliquely from, from the lateral side to join that tendon. So that's flexor pollicis longus. As the name would suggest, it's going to flex the thumb. Then medial to that, we have flexor digitorum profundus. And again, distally here where you're likely to find it on a specimen, you'll just be looking at tendons. There'll be three or four of them there that you'll be able to spot. So flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum profundus, attaching distally to the, di the uh, distal phalanges of digits two, three, four, and five. Flexor pollicis longus going to the distal phalanx of the first digit. So that's the third layer, just two muscles in the third layer. Now we can't see the fourth layer here. It's pronator quadratus on its own, again, of one muscle. Um, it, is, it sits here on the distal um, anterior radius and ulna. If you can gently move these fibres aside on a specimen of flexor pollicis longus, you'll probably see the fibres of pronator quadratus there. And we do have a couple of deep specimens where there's nothing covering it and you can see the whole muscle. So make sure you do manage to find that when you're looking for it. Okay, so that's the flexors. There's only eight of them, in, but in four layers. 
Now let's look at the extensors. Now the good news is there's only two layers. Bad news is there's 12 of them all together. So there's quite a lot to see. So here we've got distal tendon again, biceps brachii. If we move lateral from there, from in the cubital fossa, we'll find brachia radialis. Now that's not an extensor muscle, it's a flexor of the forearm at the elbow, but it's always grouped with the extensors because it just sits with them. Its attachment is the lateral supracondylar ridge, proximally, and then the distal lateral radius distally. Now just next to that, and hopefully you can see on the screen, a dividing line here. So here's brachioradialis, just next to that we have extensor carpi radialis longus, Again, proximal attachment, lateral supracondylar ridge. Just next to that, we then have extensor carpi radialis brevis attaching to the lateral epicondyle there. Now we can, fortunately, follow these two along so we can see them with tendinous fibres here. But later on, if we keep going distally, we will find that we have the tendon of extensor carpi radialis longus here. So distal to the extensor retinaculum. We find it here attaching to the base of the second metacarpal. So that's it there. Now just medial to it, we'll then have extensor carpi radialis brevis. So there's the tendon there. We can't see the metacarpal here, but it's attaching to the base of the third metacarpal. So on most specimens, you'll be able to find those. And certainly on these models, obviously, they're, they're fairly easy to spot. Now, if we carry on with the superficial extensors, the next one is a big one, extensor digitorum. So, we can see it coming from the lateral epicondyle, largish muscle belly, under the extensor retinaculum. Now, the tendons are here, going to the second digit, and it's, there's two tendons here, it's the lateral one. So, that's extensor digitorum. Then there's one here, going to the third digit, one going to the fourth. It's neither of these two, going to the fifth, gets to the fifth digit by a little tenderness intersection here. Now it's not always this big and obvious. On the specimen sometimes it's very small and, and it's a bit more distal, but it should be there. So make sure you do look for that one. Then the next muscle belly we find is extensor digiti minimi. And again on the model they're showing there's a fairly clear dividing line here between digitorum digiti minimi. Now usually on the specimens that doesn't really exist here. Usually you can only see them as being separate from about here on distally. So that's extensor digiti minimi. And usually you'll find two tendons, both from that muscle belly, traveling down to the extensor expansion of the fifth digit. Now, if we move medially again from there, we then have extensor carpi ulnaris attaching down to the fifth metacarpal. Next to that, we have flexor carpi ulnaris. So just remember, they're right next to each other. We've gone right around. That was the last extensor we'll see here. So the flexor carpi ulnaris is the next muscle we'll see. Make sure you can spot that and figure that out. But the last superficial extensor as we go around is anconius. It's a short muscle, only good for extending the forearm at the elbow, nothing to do with the wrist or hand, of course. So there's anconius there. So that's the seven superficial extensors. Let's have a look at some deep ones now. So if we remove the super, some of the superficial ones there, we can see in the proximal forearm on the lateral side, supinator. So this is supinator here. It's very adjacent to the distal attachment of pronator teres. And we can see the radial nerve here splits into a deep branch and a superficial branch and the deep branch goes into supinator. So that's pretty cool to be able to see that there. Now, if we then move distally, the next four muscles, or the last four we need, are a bit more distal. The first one we'll see, emerging from under extensor digitorum here, is the abductor pollicis longus. So that's abductor pollicis longus. So it's attaching down here, base of the first metacarpal and only goes that far. It has a fairly broad tendon here, so it's pretty easy to find as long as it's clear to see it. Um, then next to that we have a much smaller muscle belly, which is the extensor pollicis brevis. Now on the model it's a little misleading. 
The tendon is right next to the abductor, longus, like they've got it here, but it's usually very thin. It's usually a very slender tendon. It attaches to the proximal phalanx of the first digit. Then the next one we'll find, we won't see a muscle belly on this model, but here's extensor pollicis longus, which goes to the distal phalanx of the thumb. The muscle belly will be up under, under extensor digitorum here. Uh, we do have some deep specimens where extensor digitorum is removed and you can clearly find these, all these muscle bellies. And then lastly, we have extensor indices, which is this one here. So where there are two tendons going to the index finger, second digit, here the, the more medial of them will be extensor indices. Remember the lateral one is extensor digitorum. 